Good morning, everyone, and welcome. None of us are getting any younger, and significantly more of us are getting older. Take the UK, for example. In 2016, there were 12 million residents aged 65 years and over. That was 18% of the population. Fast forward to 2066, and we will have added the equivalent of the population of London to this demographic. That's around 20 million or so over 65, 26% of the population. And the demographic shift will be more pronounced in many of the developed nations, particularly outside of Europe. So what are governments and industry doing to adapt to the changing needs and expectations of older customers and older workers? This session is entitled Opportunities from an Aging Population, Longevity Strategies for 21st Century Business. Let me introduce the panel from my right and, and your left. First of all, we have Paul Irvin, who is the chairman of the Milken Institute Center for the Future of Aging, distinguished scholar in residence at the Davis School of Gerontology, University of Southern California. Next to him, Stuart Kirk, who's head of global, the Global Research Institute at DWS, still perhaps better known to some as the asset management arm of, uh, of Deutsche Bank. Amanda McKenzie is chief executive of Business in the Community. It's the Prince of Wales's responsible business network. She also sits on the board of Lloyd's Banking Group. And finally, Andrew Scott, who's professor of economics at London Business School and author of The 100-Year Life. Andrew, let me start. And I'm James Ashton. I'm a financial journalist and <laughs> consultant <laughs> for the Gordons of Doubt. Andrew, let me start with you. Can you map out this 100 years? How will people at, at the age of 100 have regarded the world of work? Will these older people want to work or need to work? Yeah, can I just first of all say I think there's two things happening, and your introduction focused on one of them very well. But what we're seeing in society is there's more old people. As the birth rate declines and people live for longer, there's more old people. And that ageing society gets a lot of focus. But there's something else that's happening, which is that how we're ageing is changing. We are, in effect, younger for longer. If you look at various indicators like mortality rates and the incidence of things like even Alzheimer's. So those two channels are very different. More old people, but how we're ageing is changing. So the average British person today has never been older, but never had a lower mortality rate. They've never had so long left to live. So I think focusing on an ageing society is kind of a little bit ambiguous, because if I've never been old, if the average person has ever been older, sure, it's an ageing society, but if they've got more life to live than ever before, then perhaps they're not as old as we think. And that's the theme of the, the book I wrote with Linda Grattan, The 100-Year Life, because we've got more time. One in three children born in the UK today will live to 100, according to the government. And how do we plan a 100-year life? And of course, the key thing about that is that changes all of life, not just end of life. There's a natural tendency to think about this as about end of life issues, what to do when you're 70 or 80. But we're seeing the invention of new behaviors in people's 20s and their 40s. And of course, people are working more after their uh, 60s and 70s. Uh, and yes, to answer your question, you know, how do we redesign life? In the 20th century, we invented teenagers, we invented retirement, we invented a three-stage life of education, work, and retirement. If you've got a life expectancy of 100, that gives you something like a 60-year career if you sort of base yourself around savings decisions. And there's no way our current work structure can survive a 60-year career. So we're going to have to change. We're going to have to dip in and out. And of course, that also means that currently older workers are going to have to work for longer than they previously thought. And because they want to or because they just simply have to? Well, a combination of things. And of course, the other great secret about aging is people age differently. Some people age well. Some people don't age well. So some people won't be able to and won't want to. Others will be able to and will want to. The great secret is out. People are different. They have different circumstances. And that's the same for older people as well as for younger people. But of course, if you're living to your 90s, you will have to work for longer. I don't know how many people here in their mid-40s have got some bad news for you. You've probably got more work to come than you've done already. Uh, so you know, this isn't just about older people. But we also know, of course, that good work and a sense of engagement and purpose is also good for your health mm. and mm. good for your longevity. Mm. So ultimately, I think if we can structure work right, people will want to work as well mm. as need to work. And, and Paul, coming to you, is that the upside of a rapidly aging population? You know, that the, the, the longer people work, the healthier they feel or so? So, so it's a combination. So the, so the upside um, affects potentially positively in institutions in, in many ways, the opportunity to, to capture the accumulated knowledge and wisdom and experience of, of people for, for longer, to, um, to market, to 
to this new and, and changing demographic, as Andrew mentioned, it's not, not, just, it's not just centenarians, it's people uh, kind of realizing this longevity dividend really through, throughout their lives. And it's very much, it's, it's families. It's the opportunity for, for people to uh, experience not only their grandchildren, but great-grandchildren for, for multi-generational connections, uh, for changing uh, cities. The, the truth of the matter is, is we're experiencing something that has never, never occurred in the history of humankind. So starting about 150 years ago, roughly, as a result of, of improvements in sanitation and safety and, and, and medical advances, uh, uh, significantly the, the advent of, of antibiotics, uh, lives started to, to extend on, on average. And so the population has never looked as it, as it does today. We have more more centenarians we've ever had on the, on, in the history of, of, of uh, humanity. Uh, the Queen sends more uh, congratulatory telegrams than she's, uh, than she's ever sent, sent before, and, uh, and we have more 65-year-olds. But of course, what that means is that we all have to think in new ways about this life course. We have to convey those messages to our children. We have to change the institutions that we, that we operate in. We have to recognize the business opportunities. If we do those things, the potential for economic growth, for the realization of wonderful uh, opportunities is, is uh, tremendous. And if we don't do those things, then the potential societal costs mm -hmm. and individual risks are massive. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, in the midst of a time in which in the UK uh, there are the daily debates about Brexit and in the US we have our, our various political tumults that, that occur kind of on an hourly basis or on the basis of the latest, the latest tweet, it's sometimes hard to think about um, these macro events, but this is one of the things that's going to shape the 21st century and centuries to come, and, um, and so we all have to prepare for it. I was going to try and keep this as a Brexit-free session, but you've broken it to rule already. <laughs> Almost you've, impossible. You've done it, yeah. so we're, we're off. We're off. <laughs> but actually, it, to sum up really, I mean, the first principles of this debate is you should approach ageism from a point of view, uh, people living longer, there's a, there's a great joy to it. Yep. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, uh, there can be a great joy, but as Andrew, as Andrew mentioned, and, you know, old, older people are as diverse as any other part of the population. Yeah. So, so we have, um, you know, we, we talked about uh, Alzheimer's and other dementias. About a third of people over 85 have Alzheimer's or some other form of dementia. That means two thirds don't. Mm. Uh, there are people who have the resources and the and the education to realize uh, great new opportunities. Oh. There are those who who don't. So. Mm -hmm. You know, part of this discussion need, needs to be how do we democratize, whether it's the opportunities for lifelong learning, lifelong work, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the uh, delay or, or repression of, of non-communicable diseases, which really present the greatest global risk these mm -hmm. days as infectious disease has been pretty effectively tackled. Mm -hmm. so, so how do we make sure that it's not just folks like the folks in this room, but the broader mm -hmm. society that have the opportunity mm -hmm. to realize this longevity dividend? Mm -hmm. I should just remind people this is a public session, so please tweet hashtag MI Global um, if you'd like to. Amanda, we talked about, you know, there's clearly a lot more uh, older people around for longer. In terms of the workplace, though, it feels to me like ageism is, is a sort of last frontier that needs to be tackled. Do you, do you see that in, in how you're working with companies? Um, I, well, I, I suspect there's several frontiers that we haven't yet defined right. still to tackle. Um, and I think in terms of the other isms, um, the, the difference in this one is this is kind of the feel sorry department. So no one really feels sorry for me as a woman, but they might over the years have treated me differently and they're not the same. So I think it strikes me as the key thing to, to I think society has to embrace the business benefit, which mm. sounds an awful way of describing getting older, but mm. every day there's another stat that shows that customer experience is better. Uh, for you know, when you have someone who's slightly older in that workforce, and there mm. is a benefit to it. Um, so I feel actually the more that that can lead, because we know with all the other isms that something similar has happened. Mm. Um, I think it, it will, you know, quite apart from it being the right thing to do and embracing wisdom and all of that. Um, I think that that will lead more and more companies to the path of going right. Mm. Let it, how we recruit, retrain. Um, and, and, um, and, you know, embrace our older workers. Because there is some, as you say, there's, there's, there's anecdotal 
evidence that it's, it's, it's better to have older workers in the workforce. I'm wondering whether we've got the full stats yet, the actual, there's, there's enough proof points. Well, of course, what will happen is some will say the direct causality won't exist. But oh. if, I, if I can quote a couple, and forgive me, just because God has a sense of humour, I've hurt my back. So I've had some Nurofen and Ibuprofen because I was going to do an ageing panel. I now feel 125. <laughs> um, and, and so I'm sitting here feeling slightly delicate. Uh, so for fear, I, I don't forget my stats. But um, so... To give you a couple of measures, customer satisfaction for FSCS uh, improved, um, well, it was up 77% when they had someone who was over 50 in their workforce. For McDonald's, I love this, um, their customer satisfaction in store is 20% higher, even if they have just one person over 60 helping out in that store. Um, Aviva, had a, they, they are really trying hard with uh, recruiting over 55s, yeah. and their net promoter score is now 42 relative to an industry average of 34. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm saying. You're not, you know, someone's going to say, well, there might be other reasons why that's the case. Yeah. But there's quite a body of evidence that would yeah. say this is absolutely good for business, it's mm -hmm. good for customers, it creates a more empathetic environment, and actually all around it creates a more thoughtful environment. And why does that... W so the McDonald's one, so one, what, what, what difference do they make? if there's one older person in, in, in store? Um, I, I genuinely, I can't, I will, I will give you a, a view, but I don't know exactly why that is the case, uh, okay. as in, you, you know, maybe, maybe some of these other brilliant you, you experts you will guess, but yeah. I suspect they will create a more caring and, and, and yep. empathetic environment. I think they will reduce some of the emotion that happens. Yep. Um, you've got people that are going to stay longer because we know, you know, people that are slightly older are five times more likely to stay in post, therefore be more loyal, therefore yep. the recruitment costs are, you know, less, etc. Mm. So it's, you know, so I think it's just, a, it's, a, it's a therapeutic mm. uh, addition to a working environment. Yep. But I feel there's a better answer to that. Yeah, Paul, you, I think you know about the, the that, that case study. I mean, that, that's what Amanda said is, broad, is broadly right, isn't it? It's about, it, it's about in making not only the, the, the workforce but also the customer, uh, you know, ordering sure. the food away, more I mean, respectful. Look, it's, it's, it's relatability in, in, yeah. in some respect, right? As, as this demographic grows as a, as a consumer class, um, uh, the relatability of, of those who are, who are uh, serving you and those who are designing products and services and innovating for you and all the rest and um, the, the relevance of them relating is, is, is important. But I, look, I think, and we could spend more time on it, but um, uh, I think what we're recognizing increasingly is this complement of skills of, of young people, young and old, the risk-taking inclinations of young, the creativity, the balance, multi-sectoral, mm -hmm. uh, problem-solving and opportunity, um, creating characteristics of older people are a really powerful combination. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and certainly, you know, Andrew knows some of the research that's been that's been uh, done on this, but uh, there's increasing evidence that that um, that uh, mixed generation teams, that intergenerational teams, actually actually outperform, outproduce same age yeah. teams of any age. Again, it's intuitive, right? Mm -hmm. A complement of skills. Same mm -hmm. same argument for for women in the workforce and people of of racial and, and ethnic diversity and all the rest. Mm -hmm. a, a, mi a mix of views, a mix of talents, uh, probably means competitive success. Yeah, Stuart, do you from from the point of view of the city, I mean, do you think investors buy the business case? Yeah, it's strange. I mean, I've been a journalist for most of my career, so it's weird to now play the kind of evil investment guy thinking, how do I make money out of this theme? Um, <laughs> but, you know, there are people thinking about this clearly, and in, in, in the asset management business, this is clearly what we do all day long. And I think there's a third element to what Andrew said, in the sense that obviously you've got more old people, okay, tick. Um, they're healthier and they're living longer, tick. Um, but like the old Irish joke, from a financial perspective, you wouldn't start from here. And we know all the statistics around how little savings a lot of these old people start with. In roughly, you know, half of 55 to 65-year-old Americans have no savings whatsoever. We know that the average amount for the rest is 100 grand. Let's say that generates $3,000 worth of income a year. It's not enough. So my industry really needs to step up and work out how those people are going to generate enough income um, to live this very long life. And there are really three options. Either you start saving earlier, uh, you get a higher rate of return on your savings, or you work longer. And I suspect um, it's going to be the third element which drives um, this topic for the next 30 years or so, people are just going to be forced to work mm. longer. There's nothing inherent that will drive returns any higher. It, it's too late for these people to have started accumulating savings earlier, mm. so they have to work longer. Now, take my asset management hat off and put my analyst hat on. What does that mean? 
Clearly, there's going to be a demand shock. People are going to buy more things um, in old age. Okay, tick. Um, but from a person running a business or from an equity holder point of view, what does it mean? There's a supply shock of new labor. So does that mean that nominal wages get driven down? Um, and there's a productivity um, effect to that because there's actually quite a strong long-term relationship between nominal wage growth and productivity. When management teams are held to account when wages rise, usually two years later you get a productivity boost. That would be a good thing. Um, equally, all other things being equal, if I have a bigger pool of labor, um, I know I'm not going to hire more people, but I can choose better workers. So I should be able to pick a higher caliber of, um, of labor from, from the pool. Both things, I think, um, are potentially productivity boosting. The one thing that wouldn't be is if this turns into a huge supply shock and wages are driven downwards, because that will allow management teams to be lazy, all other things being equal, and I don't think that would be um, mm. productivity enhancing. Yeah. Andrew, do you fear lazy management teams? I, I think everyone fears lazy management teams. <laughs> um, and I, I think, you know, so what is happening is, that on average, we're living for longer, and we're healthier for longer. And that must be good news, and it must be good news for the economy. The thing around that, though, is that everything changes. And I think we tend to focus on sort of simple things like just make people work longer. And you know, what we're hearing here is you know, diversity is good for productivity. Diverse teams are better. And ageism is just another dimension of that. We've also got more people who are more productive than before. So firms should be more interested in these potential workers. And though I'm always wary about age stereotypes, if you look at the sort of skills that everyone says are going to be in demand with the rise of robots and artificial intelligence, it tends to be sort of human empathy and skills that we tend to associate with older workers. So definitely the business case of being interested in older workers is there. But of course, we've got to do something to ensure they remain productive. And I think you know, that there's a whole host of changes that come with that, including things like education. And education either provided by firms or through uh, private firms selling to older workers or through colleges and institutions, etc. Then we've got to think about health because you know, if you simply stretch out a career for 60 years at the current pace we do, you are not going to be healthy, productive and committed later. So firms then need to start thinking about how they change recruitment because you don't just recruit at the beginning of someone's career, you're going to have to be doing on-cycle recruitment. Mm. Um, so there's you know, a host of issues to do to try and support more productive workers some of those are in the hands of individuals, some are in the hands of corporates, and many of them are in the hands of government. And so you're saying that a, 70, a typical 70-year-old in the world of work can do anything that a 20-year-old can do, other than no. some of the physical activities, no. or is well, it, it different? It's, a different it, it's certainly true that robotics and AI are fantastic for older workers. I mean, robots can do a lot of the physical work. Yeah. AI is like a sort of cognitive prosthetic, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I, I can't remember something, I'll look it up online. Uh, hopefully, I, what I find online is true. Um, so, you know, th these are technologies that definitely boost older workers. We're also going to see, because there are a lot of older workers, technology doesn't just happen in a vacuum. Firms look at technologies that work with the available labor force. And if you've got more well, older workers, you will see technologies that leverage those older worker uh, skills. Um, so, you know, 70 year olds are different from 70 year olds in the past. They're different from 20-year-olds. There's a great deal of diversity, but we can structure a workplace that makes people more productive and recognises that they are more productive already. Amanda, do you think the way... I suppose there's, a, there's the myths to get over of older people in the, in the workforce. Is, is the way that the enlightened companies should be holding on to long-serving workers for longer or recruiting at uh, you know, the age of 60, 65, 70, or you're going to say a mix of the two? Yes. Uh, well done. Yes. <laughs> uh, but even small things like, you, you know, we, we do a sort of blind um, testing of, of words in, in recruitment ads. Even just having something like the words dynamic and energetic puts off an older mm. worker who is probably perfectly dynamic and energetic for the role that they're being recruited mm. for. And actually, you don't really need thousands of puppies leaping around the place, mm. creating <laughs> noise and perhaps too much work. Um, you know. and, and actually, a little bit of thought and care and reflection is probably a good thing. So, you know, be thoughtful about how you recruit and the words that you use. I mean, I think, you know, every aspect of this. Mm. Uh, and, and similarly, you can put off young people by the wrong words there. I mean, across mm. the board, you look, just be thoughtful about that. Um, 
and then piece together a really good team. Mm. One of the things that I know BT was working on a, a while back was, um, and, I, and I'm not, and I feel bad that I don't know if this has actually happened yet, um, but they were looking at HoloLens technology where, through virtual reality, uh, their older engineers, who were perhaps a little bit older of clambering up the, mm. the um, telegraph poles, were coaching in situ their younger engineers. Mm. So both had very meaningful work. One was being coached by the older guy, usually a guy, forgive me if I'm being stereotypical there. Um, and and what, a, what a really productive way mm. for the transference of skills across across. A, yeah. you know, decades. So, and, and that feels a lovely little way to think about, you know, how we create these very balanced, neurodiverse, because mm. I think there's an element of that going on here, uh, teams. And actually, the, it, it's sort of, the, the, there are other benefits, so particularly with, with flexible working, so when, yes. um, when that, yes. women typically want to step back from the workforce when, when they're having children or whatever, there's a, the, there should be clever ways where Older workers can job share or whatever with with uh, the, the 35, 40. Yeah, for very much so. But also one thing that we found is that advertising flexibility in uh, of, of uh, right at the start is is a really big turn on for people because they mm. want to know that because a lot of people as they're getting older are that sandwich generation so they're having to care mm. so they need caring days. A lot of our best employers they have some caring days as standard mm. and they even have unexpected caring days which we mm. all know you know these things happen. Mm. So actually being very clear in your job ad that mm. actually flexibility it, role flexibility is built in <laughs> is a really good thing too. Mm. Paul, one of the problems in this area is language, isn't it? The how um, people don't want to self-identify as being um, as being old. It's something that's always going to happen in, in the future. And, and I think the term, probably many people in this room realise that the new term now is perennials, uh, not millennials, <laughs> per perennials, and so on. But there needs to be a lot more of this, I suppose. Always blooming. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, look, ageism is is pervasive, right? So, so mm. we we have attitudes about, uh, you know, you're, you're sitting watching a guy with, with, with no hair and there are obviously assumptions uh, that, are, that are made about that relating to competence and capability and energy and all the rest, some of which are accurate, some are, some are inaccurate. <laughs> I think that, I, look, I, I think it's one of the things that's really important to say here yeah. is that this topic is not just for older people. I, I, you know, mm -hmm. Andrew made the point earlier and I think it's really important to underscore we don't just have 10 or 20 or 30 years, depending on where you measure from, tacked on at the end of life. What we have is we have uh, additional time spread throughout life. And so, and so um, young people have as much or frankly more, I think you've made the point about, uh, or maybe it was Andrew, about the, the prospect for, for young Brits living, li living longer life, and that's very much true in, in the US and, and other places as well. Um, so, so no one has a stake in, in these changes that we're, we're advocating as much as young people, thinking about how education has to change. The notion, how, how many people, I'm curious, how many people in this room, let's say, have gone back to get a graduate degree after 40? Raise hands. Not one, not one, per, no, so not one person in a, in a full room has, has raised a hand. So, uh, we have one. <laughs> congratulations. Can't good, good. Well, <laughs> good, uh, good. Congratulations and, and good for you. So, so a question that one has to ask is, in a world in which um, young people may live may live to a hundred and seek to be creative and engaged and involved and active and have meaningful and purposeful lives for that long, how in the world could we have? you know, a 60, 70 year gap between the time they finish traditional college, mm. let's say, mm. and the time when they might be trailing off from, from their second or third or fourth career. So mm. guess what? For, for those uh, Oxfordites and Cambridge, Cambridgeites in, in, in the room, we need to completely reinvent how we think about mm. uh, the, the uh, delivery of education and the expectations for education. Why should, why should uh, we be educating people in their 10s and 20s and 30s? By the way, these Mm. Institutions made immense sense, oftentimes designed at times when, again, average lives were mm. uh, 20 or 30 years old. So it's just an example of why, why we all have a stake in, mm. in, these, in these institutional changes. Can I just like up on that one? Because, I mean, yeah. you know, to talk about the changes that are going to happen, I mean, education clearly is going to have to become lifelong with technology and longevity. But already this year, so Harvard University is an extension school providing education to people after they've graduated. This year, Harvard Extension School took on more students than the rest of Harvard put together. This is, you know, this is sort of a, sort of a sea change that we're about to see. And I think you know, one of the things that's so interesting about our thinking here, and you know, 
Paul's saying this is about every, every aspect of life. As we're living longer, we redesign all of life. And there has to be some sort of sense of recursivity. And what, the reason I say this is that it's remarkable how we talk about the young and old being put together. Because the future old are the current young. And we sort of almost treat young and old as different ethnic groups. But of course, what you do when you're in your 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s affects what you're doing in your 60s and your 70s and your 80s. And if we want to encourage healthy aging, we don't just start with people in their 70s. Right. We've got to think about the entire life course. Mm. Now, what this means is that anyone in work right now has to think about doing their life differently from the life we've structured. And so much of our thinking in the 20th century came about with this three-stage life. And we have this category of over 65s. You know, once you're 65, boom, you know, you're in some special homogenous group. That group is getting large. It's massively heterogeneous. And we've got to think about the whole pathway from 20 to 80. And so flexible working isn't just something that older people want. It's something that you will need at some point in your career, irrespective of your age. If you've been working from 20 to 40, and you've got another 30, 40 years of your life ahead of you, mm. you'll be interested in flexible working. Mm. So we've got to think about the recursivity of the life course and recognize the connections between young and old. What we know is that aging is malleable. Your behavior now affects how you age in the future. And if we really want to make the most of this longevity dividend, we have to think about the whole life course and not just talk about the old and the young because the current young become the old. Millennials are quite old now. They're not young anymore. And we've got to sort of think about the whole aging course. Mm. It strikes me that this whole process could be very problematic unless we completely change basically our level of patience and the expectation for our own trajectory. We all, you know, in the firm I currently work, people expect to be made VP after two years and then director after three and then MMD after a certain number of years. And if what you say is going to happen is going to happen, our elongation of our expectations is going to have to stretch massively. Um, in my old industry, in newspapers, for example, you know, if you weren't given a column after 15 or 20 years, like me, you disappear off in a huff. And, you know, there are only six or seven positions at the FT that were available, and, you know, Martin Wolf had one, and John Gapper had one, and, you know, these people never, ever leave. Now, in the olden days... It's true. It's true. In the olden days, after a certain length of time, you disappear off like Joe Johnson or me or whoever, all the heads of Lex, you, you go because there's nowhere else to go. But if you're talking now about a 60-year career or a 70-year career, maybe I now wait for 20 years for that job to, to come up. And that expectation management has to completely change. And when we bring in new grads now, we are going to have to educate <coughs> them in a, in a career trajectory which used to be like that, and we're going to have to tell them it's more shaped like that. And I think that process is going to be very, very difficult to change, but we need to change it quite quickly, because patience is something that, for some reason, all of us have, have lost. I've got to go. You thought, yeah. have, you thought, have you thought of a blog? You could start a blog. Is, it, is that where you throw people to, no, <laughs> to am amuse yourself with a blog for exactly. 20 years while you wait for that? Is, is <laughs> the problem, because the, the session is about strategies, strategies for business, yep. but I guess, as, as Andrew says, the individual has to plan for this. And actually, um, the people who were born now or in the last decade who have a very good chance of living to 100 um, are very bad planners. I mean, the UK savings ratio is, is at the lowest it's ever been. So, um, you know... The, the businesses have to help their individuals, their workforce, actually think, think about the future as well. Yeah, well. My daughter just started school at four. This elongation process could just affect everything. Start at 10, mm. go to university mm. at 30. Yeah. Ta mm. Don't take a gap year, take a gap five years. Mm. The whole thing should yeah. just yeah. needs to sort of well, stretch. Those things yeah. already are beginning to happen. The average <laughs> age of marriage in the UK is now 31. It used to be 21, even 50 years ago. In Sweden, the average age of first marriage is 36. You're now more likely in the UK as a woman to have a child in your 40s than under 20. That's never happened before. Uh, we've got a doubling in the proportion of people working aged over 70. And my own favorite indicator of longevity is the divorce rate, which is falling on average, but rising for the over 50s and rising fastest in the over 80s. Mm. Uh, you know, and I can't think of a better statistic about longevity than rising divorce rates for people who are 80 plus. Yeah. Uh, talk, there talk, are talk about new business happening. <laughs> yeah. There is. Um, there, there are a few enlightened businesses, but yeah. I guess for most of them, the idea of uh, you, you turning up and saying, do you have a longevity strategy? They probably haven't got a clue, have they? There's so many businesses have to, have, haven't switched on to this yet. 
It, it's true, but I have to say, our, our, we have an age leadership team, which is nobly and brilliantly chaired by uh, the CEO of Aviva UK, Andy Briggs, and some brilliant enlightened leaders around that, at that table, and they set themselves the target to look at what, what it would take to get an old, uh, um, a million older workers to stay or be, come back into the workforce by 2022, and I'm pleased on their behalf to say that they're on track to do that. But that uh, is absolutely looking at everything from older worker apprenticeships mm. through to the things we've already covered in terms of how you recruit, how you retain slash retrain. Um, so literally looking at every um, kind of cus you know employee experience moment and adapt it or think about mm. it in through the lens of keeping people in the workforce for longer in productive, meaningful, healthy, good work. Mm. Um, so yes, I think it's it's. As the, uh, I suppose that's why I started by saying the kind of the business benefit, because as people begin to absolutely accept that this is the world around us, this mm. is what's happening, then it becomes a lot easier to have those conversations and then everything else rolls out. So mm. yes, as, you, as ever, there's the enlightened ones and, yep. and the ones that will catch up because they'll realise actually after a while they're really struggling to get enough people to do the roles they need to do. Yeah. Andrew, uh, I mentioned Brexit again. Um, particularly with the UK point of view, do you think Brexit is a moment at which companies will, will turn on to this? I mean, there is a, a thought that down the line, uh, you know, migration will tighten and companies need to be more creative on yeah. the talent side. Well, we've got a fall in the birth rate, uh, which is, you know, meaning fewer people coming through. We've got probably a reduction in immigration coming along. So, yeah, workers are going to become more important. And there's a whole bunch of workers who may want to carry on working that firms will be interested in. Mm. I mean, I can't emphasize enough, this is a massive social experiment. So uh, I don't think there's going to be one year where everything changes. Mm. Mm. Innovation is invariably some sort of S-curve, and we're certainly in the lower reaches of that S-curve. There are pioneers and people doing things at the moment. I think the other thing firms will realize is it's not just about holding on to workers in their 60s, but actually, if, if you're 40 or 50 and you're looking ahead, you will be looking at how firms give you options later in your career. Mm. Yep. So if you think about the invention of corporate pensions in the 20th century. Firms said to people, I'll pay you a low wage today, I'll give you money in the future when you retire. And that was a recruitment and retention tool. Now we talked about savings, but there's not enough savings you can do, I think, to support a 100 year life and still retire at 65. So I'm gonna be very interested in working for a firm <coughs> in a broader range of investments, not just financial investments, but do you give me an opportunity to take time off to spend time with my uh, older relatives or with my young children or just my partner so I can recoup. Are you going to give me opportunities to learn? Are you going to give me opportunities to go from full time to flexi time and back mm. again? So corporates will start to think about a broader concept of a pension than just mm. finances because that'll be a big recruitment and retention tool. Mm. What's worrying, of course, is that the firms who value human capital the most will do that. The ones who don't think human capital is important won't. So we're going to see a lot of di uh, diversion. Mm. So there will be a diversity a role for governments to standardise that process. Another implication I think is inevitable. Um, a massively a big topic at the moment is about pay disparity in firms and in general. And we see headlines every day about CEOs earning X and we now have to report the difference between the highest paid and the lowest paid in firms. And this is a very, very divisive topic. And I think when you look at the way firms are going to develop, analysts will always say, look at incentives and look at pay structure mm -hmm. first to work out how a firm is going to operate. If you have a big dis pay disparity between your leader and the up-and-comers, as an up-and-comer, like a young chimpanzee on a David Attenborough film, you want that boss out. You want to replace him so that you get that excess pay. And everything is, and I worked for an investment bank, and I've seen you know, this sort of animal instinct go on. <laughs> you want that top guy shot, and you want to replace him because you want that excess pay. So if we are going to move to an 80-year career, pay disparity has to come right, right, right down, really, really flat, so you have just as much respect, mutual respect at the top level, at the bottom level. And I actually think that this whole pay disparity topic is actually going to go away as we enter this um, ageing aging world over the next 100 years, and that will be a good thing, and that will have implications to you know, asset classes, property, blah, blah, blah. So we've got chimpanzees and puppies now. We've totally. got the full <laughs> and Brexit. <laughs> do, you think, do you think, though, um, that pay disparity, does that, does that come back? Do you think the, because of what the older worker delivers in terms of experience and sort of keeping everyone calm behind the counter at McDonald's and so on, are they worth more for the same job? Well, I think a, as a management team, it will be the only way to keep people. 
Mm. Otherwise, they'll, they'll leave to go somewhere else. Otherwise, they'll become disheartened. And as an investor, I, will, I don't want to see turnover. So as an yeah. investor, I'll encourage companies to do that. Um, and I think, you know, you know, there's a lot of literature to say that they end up being better investments yeah. anyway. Can because I just pick up on this point, though? Because I think this is actually this is one of the crux of the matters. I mean, I, in general, I agree. So older workers are more productive on average than they used to be. So firms should be more interested in them. There's very little evidence that productivity declines with age. Age is a very poor predictor of productivity. The problem we do have is that wages tend to increase with tenure. So even mm. if productivity doesn't decline with age, if wages increase with tenure, older workers get kicked out. And I think trying to tackle that problem is going to be crucial to ensuring mm. employment from the 50 plus uh, onwards. Because there is a feeling that, that older workers are, are, are it's gr they're great to have around, but, but, but when times get tough, they're almost an expensive luxury. Yeah, well, there, there's kind of an operating assumption that compensation al always has to go up. And there are a series of, of challenges in, in changing that norm, right? Whether, whether it's, it's, it's union relationships or, or just, uh, just pay traditions. There was actually some interesting research done several years ago in, in the US that this was a poll-based research that suggested that people actually were, were very open to the notion of compensation reduction or compensation flattening in exchange for the kind of work yeah. that they wanted to do, if, yeah. if, if the work was respectful, if they had the opportunity to, to mentor younger, younger people, if they had the kind of flex arrangements that Andrew mm. uh, referred to, to, to before. So we have to think creatively. I, I would actually, it's interesting, as somebody who advocates for older workers, I would actually say in response to your last question, do they have to make more? I would say no. I'd say what does have to change is, is, the, is the work environment. And, and I'd just like to build on for a moment on something that Andrew was referring to, and that is what I think we're going to see, I think we're already seeing the very, very early stages of it, and that is, and I think it's going to become more prevalent as, very likely, as millennials get older who tend to, I think, more deeply embed their values in both investment decision and in work decision. But as, as we know, you know, uh, people now kind of follow companies and engage in sustainability practices, mm -hmm. ESG, uh, progressive practices relating to the employment of women, uh, women on boards, various other things. I think we're going to see a, mo a movement o over time mm -hmm. in which age-friendly practices in, in, in companies will be recognized, rewarded, they'll have an effect on the acquisition and retention yeah. of human capital. And I think they'll affect customer preference. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, in, in the U.S., I won't name names, but there are companies I won't go in. I won't go in because of their, of their political positions on, on various and sundry um, con controversies in, in the U.S. We'll, we'll steer away from them sitting, sitting in London. But I think it's very likely to be the case that the same kinds of, uh, of acquisition decisions will end up being made depending on how companies think about uh, older, both older workers and older customers. Andrew, we've talked a lot about the older worker, but then uh, from the point of view of the older uh, customer and the business opportunity there, what is it that companies should be doing to effectively market to the 60, 70 year old consumer? What is a product for them that is not a product for a 30 year old? Well, this is, uh, this is I think, one of, I mean, so th the first one is, it's, I can't tell you how little data companies have about older workers, because it all goes in that bucket mm. 65 plus. Uh, and I think one of the reasons this isn't yet a problem is that as, in general, people are healthier in their 70s than they used to be, the 70-year-olds are still buying things that used to be sold to 60-year-olds. Um, you know, the great problem with age is heterogeneity. And so people are aging differently. So in you know, the 70s and the 60, those sorts of cliches. But also there's a wide variety of heterogeneity. And I don't think firms and marketing departments totally get that. Um, so, what are the products they need? Well, you know, they need health-related products rather than age-related products. Uh, there's a different notion of what people want in the age about relationships, community. But it's just that people, you can't categorize, you know, saying 20-year-olds just want avocados. There's a huge range of, of goods that older people want. They're just like anyone else. They're heterogeneous. Mm -hmm. And firms have just got to cut the data to look at it. What I do think <coughs> is interesting is that, you know, I see 20 and 30 year olds behaving differently. I see 60 and 70 year olds behaving differently. But the world is still broadly run by the 50 year olds who aren't doing things differently. And I do suspect that we will see the emergence of firms providing products to older workers coming from someone who kind of was pushed out of a firm, understands the older age group, and in their 60s or 70s starts up a firm providing services for older people. Well, by the way, by the way Edward, I know this is true in the UK too. Some of, some of what I'm about to say relates to the lack of opportunity in traditional jobs, some of it relates to entrepreneurship. So the, the cliche, at least in the United States, 
is that unless you got a master's degree in computer science from, from Stanford and, and probably having dropped out act actually in, in your first year and started a company in Silicon Valley, you're very unlikely to be a business originator. In fact, in, in the US, yeah. middle-aged and older people start more businesses than younger, the younger people. It's true in the UK too. Um, uh, now, again, some of that may be related to the fact that, that uh, opportunity doesn't exist or as much opportunity as should uh, doesn't, ex doesn't exist in traditional work environments. Some is a product of pure entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. So uh, capital access, again, uh, in encouragement and facility for that, public policy that, that supports it, et cetera, is, is an opportunity for economic growth and for, again, keeping people more engaged, healthier, more active, et cetera. And I think that trend took off in the UK after the f financial crisis. So yep. a, de a decade ago, when yep. there, were the, the, there were the layoffs, a lot of people just thought, well, you know, I'll, st I'll start up yeah. so I'll start it myself. And interestingly, to your point, Andrew, yep. the, actually the, um, the, the leaders, not necessarily, the, well, some of the political leaders, but certainly the, the business leaders, the banking bosses, um, they effectively skipped a generation in the other yep. direction. Suddenly, you know, grey hair was in, and you, you didn't want sort of a, uh, you know, a whiz kid casino banking. You wanted someone who'd seen it and done it before. Yeah. No, yeah. I, I mean, you know, the, everything is big, slowly beginning to change. Uh, your, your point about professional service firms and their pyramid structure, I think, is a real challenge, actually. Because I think there's two ways that we'll see careers develop. Either they're going to slow down and we'll get more sort of horizontal variation in experience rather than vertical. Mm. Or you're just going to have three or four stages to your career and I'm in a rush mm. to make my money in this stage so I can then retire and do something different. But it's a real challenge for firms with a hierarchy. And of course, the best example is the royal family, where Prince Charles is 70 and still hasn't got the main job. Uh, and, you know, and, and that's a great example of, you know, what, what do I do when I'm waiting to get the big job? And that's going to be a real And challenge. all of this assumes that nothing changes, right? I mean, I think there's a mass... You hinted at this right at your first comment, Andrew, but there's a, there's a technology element here. And I sit on a committee that thinks about the type of people that we want to hire in the future and what we want the workforce to look like. And if you look forward about what machine learning and AI is going to disrupt, it's not the elderly workers who can write beautiful English and present to clients and have a high-touch role where they're empathetic with clients and they're in sales. It's these poor graduates that have just joined us having spent their time learning coding or maths or numbers. They're just going to be replaced in droves by machines. And I sort of feel sorry for them. And, you know, the, the types of people that we actually want to hire are ones that understand communication, being able to take a huge amount of information and distill it down into something comprehensible for a large room of people, etc., etc. I worry that it's actually that junior level that's been sold a furphy here. And actually, the way technology is going to benefit um, people a little bit more experienced in interpreting data and change, and I think that benefits the elderly. Well, but some elderly, I guess, those that have got the, the, tr the yep, training and the skills, some. and there's always mm -hmm. going to be that, that level of elderly who've, who've I don't know, um, worked, on a, worked on a till or yep. something, and, th and they haven't got the skills, mm -hmm. and they, they are the ones that will struggle. I'm talking in professional services, yeah, for yeah, our, yeah, yeah. our firm yeah. in particular. Yeah. 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 Um, we should say, of course, the Prince of Wales has got many jobs, including look after, looking after business in the community. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yes, and so I cannot, I'm not sure, I, I'm not sure, but he, yes, I mean, he has been the most brilliant president for ours, and forgive me if I get the, the award for gush for the day, but <laughs> really, it's a blooming massive benefit that he has had that job for mm. so long, because it has meant his vision, and you look at, you know, he was making speeches about plastics in the 70s, you know, he has been permanently talking about society and how dislocated mm. it is and what we need to think about this. Because when you were talking, I was reflecting on the fact that, you know, I, c uh, I think the age in uh, Blackpool, where we do quite a lot of work, where the su your signs of ageing and therefore you are suddenly becoming less in the workplace you are beginning to struggle begins in your 40s. Mm. You mm. know, so we have a society increasingly where there are parts of the country where, you know, it's as if, mm. you know, all of the revolution around ageing has just not happened. Absolutely. Um, and, and he was calling that yep. 30 odd years ago. And still, you know, areas like the, I mean, it's, it's a sort of, people think it's very hackneyed, but actually the, the um, east end of Glasgow is still, is still Precisely. A, you know, stand out as well. Exactly. So, so we have a, a world which is, is, never mind two tier, multiple tier, but whatever, you know, that is still a massive problem to address, but that's not the question S you're going to ask me. I'm no, no, to. I was going to say, is the prince very hands on? <laughs> no, I wasn't. I wasn't. I was going to say we talked a lot about what business can do. What can the the state do? Where does the state intervene to to make the system work better? Interesting. I because I, 
I think at all, I suppose I think about a lot of our campaigning areas, and I, I always hope that business can step up and kind of show the state yep. and lead, almost lead the state mm. in a way, uh, particularly about sustainability. On all of the, a lot of the issues, I think we don't need the state to necessarily mm. intervene. Um, so, uh, actually, I, I think often, as so often is the case, it does boil down to leadership. It boils down to leaving this room and being quite bloody-minded about saying, okay, so do we have an apprenticeship for older workers? Mm -hmm. do, are we thoughtful about what we can put in adverts, about how we can recruit, um, you know, a really lovely breadth of workers? You know, do we have flexible working built in from the beginning? Do we have care days? And you think of all the things that are in the to-do list of what yeah. it means to be an attractive employer, which means you can have this lovely... Um, you know, m mix of workforce, and none of that requires government intervention. Mm. Can I just mm. add, and okay. add, add just one one additional item to Amanda's point, and that that is tr training and reskilling, which yeah. which we know both in the U.S. and the U.K. Uh, dropped dramatically for whatever reason a after about 50. Yeah. So for so for some reason, what happens is we we make significant investments in younger employees who are actually less likely mm. to 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 stay on the job. In interestingly, yeah. they're more they're more likely to turn over and. So we, we, the answer is we got to create, I mean, obviously it requires individual incentive too. We all have to step up to the plate, but we have to create the opportunity for older people to, mm. to learn, reskill, become technologically. And if, sorry, can I just so finish? Because yeah. if, you, if you really, really mean it, then you would be very thoughtful about apprenticeship levy, which I know everyone's struggled to try and max out on, but actually go, right, we're going to take half of that deliberately. We're going to make sure that we, you know, purpose it against... Mm. Um, you know, people plus 50 to, to, to build on your point. Yeah, I should say um, uh, we've got time now for, for questions if anybody has um, anything to ask the panel and there's a mic um, roaming around. But Andrew, just to follow up with you, I mean, the, you know, we ha as Amanda says, we have got this apprenticeship levy now in the UK. It's three billion pounds a year from the larger companies. It's, it's deeply unpo unpopular because it's been implemented very poorly. But do you think that becomes the answer? That there's all, it's very well that enlightened companies will do what they want to do. Yeah. But unless the state says you will spend X billion on training uh, the over 50s or whatever age bracket, it won't happen. Well, this is a massive agenda where there's a role for individuals. There's certainly something for gov corporations to do, but the government's going to have to play an enormous role. It needs to provide a narrative to make people aware of this and make people aware of how things are different so that social norms don't lead us down a, a, an out-of-date path. Uh, I think in terms of education, you've seen a massive... The biggest damage we've seen is, a, is the way that student funding's changed, a massive reduction in part-time education. Mm. And, you know... Government's going to have to be the heart of trying to create for everyone a system of flexible, part-time, adult education. Mm. Um, they can ask corporates to help. They can provide some tax relief to do it. But governments are going to have to make sure that the majority of people get met. There's mm. a whole healthy ageing agenda that governments need to get behind. And then just things like making sure, just as so we've seen governments introduce maternity leave and paternity leave in most countries, uh, you're going to see similar things for caring leave, but also mm. just for people to take six months off with perhaps an education allowance to get those skills. So I think yeah. there's a massive role for that. So that's where, so it would be great for business to do it all, but the state does have to, does have to weigh yeah. in at some point. Businesses never do it enough. There will be yeah. some leading examples, some experimentation, but the market forces are such that governments will have to introduce some compulsion. Okay, any questions? Right the front. When you talk about the state, we currently spend 37% of government spending on uh, the NHS, which is set to rise to 50 and is already unsustainable. Uh, so uh, I'd be interested on your thoughts of how we engage a younger population in staying healthier. Because yeah. uh, we're currently ill for an average of eight and a half years in the UK compared to 18 months in Sweden, which again is unsustainable for us. So um, the whole thing, uh, feels unsustainable completely from a just purely health point of view and how do we engage people differently Paul you can talk about yeah the I mean I, so so you know I'm, I'm the non bread on, on stage so I, I know enough about the NHS to, to, to be dangerous but but um, but I but I would say that I think both in Britain and, and the US fundamentally we don't have a health system we have a disease a disease care system and the single most important thing we can do is to uh, invest in and emphasize prevention and wellness. We, we know it's the one thing that works. So if we tackle obesity, if we 
are, are more aggressive in our, in our um, anti, anti-smoking campaigns, if we encourage ex- exercise, if employers are actively involved as they need to be in this process of keeping their employees healthier, not just because it's the right thing to do, but because it increases productivity, uh, reduces absenteeism, presenteeism, uh, et, et cetera, we can make a huge difference. So we're spending our health, our health dollars or pounds uh, in, in, the, in the wrong way. And, and uh, what we know is that these things work. You know, cures are lovely. Uh, we, we at the Milken Institute are big advocates for investment in, in medical research and, and all the rest. It's important. It's, in a sense, kind of the holy grail in many respects. But we all know what we need to do. We need to say, stay slimmer. We need to, uh, to exercise well. We need to engage in the right nutrition practices. Uh, uh, edu- education and work, by the way, uh, lead in positive ways to, to improvement in, in health. And that will compress mortality and morbidity. That will reduce this period of time in which we are, uh, are unhealthy before death. And that's, that's the huge societal risk we have, is this, this period in which, in which um, health span is, is challenged, not lifespan. So and I others. suspect there'll be a private sector response, right? Because if you're an employer, and you have a human capital asset that lasts 18 to 20 years, you can more or less get away with not upgrading that asset all the time. But if suddenly I'm going to have that person on my books generating cash flows for 60 years, I need to invest in that person continually. And I think companies will take a lot more care Mm. of their human stock, Mm. to put it sort of rudely, um, irrespective of the state response, because it will just be the right business decision to make. More questions? Hi. Um, I had a question. A lot of the discussions around um, mortality rates, right? But the birth rates are being impacted as well because biologically humans haven't changed. So, you know, your fertility rates are high within a certain age paradigm, which is much earlier now in retrospect in your career. So what's the cultural impact of that? So uh, it's it's a great question. We are seeing around the world birth rates fall and in many countries even going below the replacement rate so that we're going to see some dramatic falls in population. So in China, the population is going to go from 1.3 billion to a billion by 2050. And of that billion, 450 million will be over 65. So this is kind of weird. We've never been in this situation before. Of course, what you're seeing is family structures are getting longer and narrower. And I think you know, we are seeing the rise of four, even five generation households. You talked about the sandwich generation. Well, I talk about the club sandwich generation because you know, <laughs> you've now got great grandparents to worry about. Um, it, it's going to be really interesting how we deal with that because obviously what we consider to be young is changing. You know, I've got a photo of my father, aged 14. He's wearing a suit and tie. He's got a job. He's paying rent. He's married at 17. He's got a kid at 18 and a house at 19. Wow. Then there's me, I sort of do that stuff in my mid-twenties. My kids, who knows when they're going to do it. So, you know, sort of, there's, there's a whole sense of adulthood happening much, much later. What we consider to be young is changing, and what we should be doing is changing. I, I guess, you know, we don't know how to structure a four-generation family. My hope is it'll be an opportunity to get greater intergenerational mixing. Yeah. Um, the biggest worry is we may then just say to sort of women, you, you know, not only you can look after children, you can look after the grandparents as well. We've got an opportunity, I think, to really reduce gender roles here. Mm. Because to gain what, what may be the biggest cultural impact, mm. if you're living to 100 and your time to have children is before 30, most of life is not about children. It's about you and your relationships. Mm. So that could do an enormous benefit to reducing the male fem- female gender divide in our policies. But I, I would just say, to, uh, to, to, to build on Andrew's point, this, this question about, about birth rate is really, is really a misunderstood question across the world. Birth rates are dropping like a rock. And, um, and they're very likely to continue to drop. It's very much a product of, of, uh, ed, of uh, reduction of ab- ab- abject poverty, something Mike Milken talked about last night, the advancement of, of, wim- of women, right? The re- reduction in child mortality rates, et cetera. So, uh, what you're seeing is, is frankly, well below replacement rates in much, much of Europe, much of Asia. Japan, mm. obviously, the, the first super-age society in, in the world, but in China and Korea and South, South Asia, uh, now increasingly in, in Latin America. And we're going to see it in India and in, in Africa as well. 
uh, and it's just a, a matter of time. And that's why this both longevity and aging phenom phenomenon is not just a you know baby boomer issue. It's not just a an issue for the for the 21st century. It's very likely to change uh, significantly the way the way humanity looks for a long time to come. And I think there is just actually one more thing about the culture. I think the prince in the, the Italian novel, The Leopard, says, I only care for those I will meet. And if we are living for longer and we're going to meet more people over our life, it may make us more patient, which may make the rate of return go down on your savings. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do wonder if it will make us more long-term in our thinking as a society. One can only hope. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we are very short of time. Any more questions, please? I wanted to go back to the point, Paul, on... Um, about, it, about people's sort of mid-career mid training and so on. Um, the Singaporean model, very briefly, looks quite interesting in the way that people are incentivized. The state will actually pay people that, that, that complete courses later into their, um, uh, into their career. Is that something that, is that gonna come to America anytime soon? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it, uh, it's, it's, it's funny. Um, I do enough of these sessions that, that we always seem to revert to, Sing to Singapore, don't we, Andrew? Um, uh, it, which, by the way, is... is, is Sorry, is a, place is, to type it's, it's, you know, it's, <laughs> it's a It's a, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, a, a lovely place. They've done an extraordinarily uh, a good, good job. If, if, um, if you, if there's any, any defense of, of that kind of government system, boy, the boy, Singapore <laughs> has, has done it both in education and in health. Yes, they have a lifelong learning institute. Yes, they have a national uh, work strategy. They do have incentives for, for the recruitment and, and could it work on a bigger scale? Though? It, uh, the answer is it could in theory, but there are a lot of, a lot of impediments. I'm kind of with Amanda and Andrew on, on this, which, which is on the one hand, I think what we have to see is pilots in, in companies, both on the, <coughs> on, the, on the workforce side and on the uh, product and service side. And then I think we have to see scaling and incentives by, by, by governments, because I think ultimately government uh, has, has to do that. I actually, in some senses, um, you know, my British friends may be surprised by this because of all the, all the political noise this week, but I'm actually a, a, a bit more, I think, optimistic about the prospects for early action in the UK than I am in, in the US, so we kind of look to, to all of you on this side of the pond for, for leadership, but I do, I do hope that both employers and, and governments, uh, and I believe that, that, that they will get it over the next several years. As Andrew says, you know, things are moving, they're moving in the right direction, they're just moving nowhere near fast enough, and mm. so, so the question is how do we accelerate conversation awareness act, action uh, in many respects. And again, uh, this is not just a bad news uh, issue. To the contrary, I think it, it creates great, great opportunity. Great and, opportunity. It's no, and it's no sort of, sort of banner year when it all happens. It's very, very gradual. I think it's right. patient development as we should be more patient in our 90 to 100 year life. <laughs> I, yeah. I think ap apropos the comments, that's right. Yeah, so. yeah. okay. Under pain of death, I have to finish this, uh, this panel on time. Um, so uh, thank you all for listening and for your feedback and thanks to our speakers, to Paul, Stuart, Amanda and Andrew. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.